Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking the time to come here. So I'm going to start the talk with a story. So you see this tower behind me, right? So about 2,000 years ago, there was a story about a civilization that was expanding. And what it wants to do, like any expanding civilization, is to build a huge tower that stretched all the way into the sky. And the gods didn't like that. So what did they do? They came up with a clever uh, way to stop people from doing this. So they simply said, we are going to confuse your language, split your language, and make it so that you can't talk to each other, so that you cannot build this thing anymore. So what's the point of this story? A lot of the systems, especially machine learning systems that we build today, are super complex. And we have, you might have seen these charts with grids of tools that you would use in different like uh, phases of your machine learning workflow. Right? So, for example, this is from a paper from Google. Right? And you see the ML code here is that small box there. Rest of it is all the systems that are orchestrating data and uh, workflows around machine learning. Right? So we are building increasingly complex things. And for example, a machine learning model has hundreds of features. There is hundreds of machine learning models in a company. And you would want to iterate across these machine learning models hundreds of times to improve them while in production. So it's a huge number of steps to make machine learning work in any given company. Right. So that brings us to Cronon. What is Cronon? Cronon is a uh, data workflow management system for machine learning. So we are going to talk today about how we uh, orchestrate workflows across different paradigms. So what do I mean by paradigms? So before we jump into the talk, a little bit about me. I lead the machine learning infra team at Airbnb. Uh, before that, I was building stream processing systems, schedulers, and compilers at Facebook. Before that, I was working on NLP systems at Walmart Labs and Amazon. All right, so what are the three paradigms that we are talking about today? Batch processing, you might be all familiar with this. There is, you know, think of data in Hive or in Redshift or in BigQuery. You uh, transform data from one static table into another static table. There's stream processing, there is event streams or mutation streams, and we are transforming them and updating indexes and whatnot. Third one is request serving. So whenever a request come in, Synchronously respond. So stream processing is asynchronous. Request serving is synchronous. So whenever a request comes in, you do some compute, pull, pull some data to out, and serve a request. All right. So this entire talk is going to be based on one example. We'll like walk through Cronon and walk through this example together. The use case is really simple. Uh, the previous talk, those of you who were here, was talking about payments. So it like flows very naturally into this talk. We are trying to identify unusual bank transactions. Right? So we are going to use a single feature. Usually, there is hundreds of features. But for this case, we are going to try to figure out how far away from a distribution of uh, transactions is the current transaction. So in the industry, it's done by what's called a z-score. So you take a distribution and look at how, many, how far it is away from the mean. So here is like an example. The user is my dog, Leela. Uh, timestamp, we have different timestamps, but I converted them to like readable timestamps just to give you a sense. And then there is the amount, right? And we are trying to compute how far it, away it is from the mean. And we are the thesis is that we are going to use that to predict if something is fraud or not. Right. So just to visualize that, Z-score tells you how many variances you are away from the mean. Now the question is, how do we update this in real time? So to simplify, let's dial the question back and say, how do we update mean in real time? I'll give you a minute. So how do you update an average or a mean in a real time. So you're getting some transactions, you're trying to compute the mean of the transaction. And how do you keep, keep that up to date in real time? Yes, right answer. So you just keep state, you split that into sum and count, and you increment the sum and increment the count whenever a new transaction comes in. 
Similarly, you can do that for do the same thing for variance. Instead of count and sum, you need to give one more thing, which is the square sum. So the point of this slide is that we need to cre keep intermediate state to update things in real time. And Cronon does this for you behind the scenes automatically. All right. So the same uh, computation reformulated in SQL looks like this. So we select the mean and variance, which are aggregations, which are grouped by the user. And we get this data from transaction history table and the stream. So such a thing is not possible in uh, traditional compute, but you can imagine if it were possible to unify data from stream and batch sources, this is what the query would look like. Right. And on read, we would compute the z-score based on the current amount. So we will say how, how far it is away from the mean of this distribution. So in terms of the data flow, we have uh, a transaction history stable. And there we are going to look at the data and bootstrap that, bootstrap the state. So in this case, the state is count sum and square sum. And we use batch processing to bootstrap this state and store in the key value store. Right. And on new transactions that are coming in, we simply update this triple of count sum and sum square. And on read, we are going to compute the z-score and to determine if this is fraudulent or not. So there is a model that is consuming this z-score, but for this diagram, you know, we don't have to consider the model. Right, so we talked about z-score, but that usually is not enough because your uh, payment patterns change over time. So let's say you, from a student, you become a uh, employed person or if you have a life event where you have a child or if you win a lottery, your distribution of payments or transactions is going to shift, right? Or let's say you lose a lot of money in like a stock market bubble, then, you know, it'll shift down. So why do we need Windows? Windows is to account and correct for the fact that things, distributions change over time. And we also can separate natural patterns. So for businesses, e-commerce businesses particularly, there is yearly patterns. So we have Black Friday or you know, Christmas and whatnot, and business cycles like go around those natural patterns. And the other thing is, especially for the fraud, fraud case that we looked at or unusual transaction case, recent data is more important. So the distribution of your transactions like, uh, 10 years ago is less important than the distribution of transactions last year. Right. And the third thing is whenever new items get added or new users register onto your platform, you want to uh, be able to do uh, transaction safety for them in the same day without having to wait for like a day to spin up the batch source. All right, so what's the other reason for Windows? Windows make model prediction stable. So if you just have sum and count that keep increasing monotonically, the whole data or the feature distribution is increasing day to day. So you would need to retrain very often. But if you use Windows, the sum and count are usually stable. So you can like reuse this model and this model will be predicting better for a long duration. Right, so if you have stable distributions of data, that lead to stable predictions. All right, so what makes Windows hard? We talked about what, what's the value of Windows, but what makes Windows hard? So when you have Windows, you need to uh, remove events from the tail of the window, not just add events. So we were looking at adding transaction count, transaction sum, and whatnot, right? If you have Windows, you need to subtract, not just add. And the other thing is that it makes the whole processing memory hungry. So instead of keeping the values, you need to also keep the values that you need to evict, not just the recent value that you need to add. And what that means in terms of design is that you cannot do a push-based architecture easily. So what do I mean by that? Push would mean that Whenever a new transaction happens, I can push feature values to another system. 
and that will not work if there are windows because the feature values change when there is a tail event that is going out of the window, not just entering the window. So the old event that exits the window will make it so that you cannot push, just push. So that means there needs to be a client that reads data. So this is what like makes uh, Windows fairly challenging. So in Cronon, we implement what's called a sawtooth window. So let's represent a uh, window along a timeline, and these are events in the window, right? And a query happens at 2.27. A sliding window will go back exactly one hour and add all the events that fall in between the 2.27 and 1.27 time marks, right? Now, the issue with this is if you're sliding precisely, we would need to remember all the events in this. The other kind of windowing that happens in industry is what's called hopping window. So if a query happens at 227, we reply to it with the result between 220 and 120. Right? So we are moving 10 minutes at a time. And sawtooth windows is basically the union of these two things. So it overcounts the sliding window and hopping window. But there is few reasons why we need uh, sawtooth windows. So hopping windows are stale. It only gets updated at the end of the 10 minute mark, right? And that's not good for fraud detection. Fraud happens, you know, especially if you're using uh, spam that is automatically generated or fraud that is bot generated. It happens in a matter of minutes. So you cannot wait for the hopping window to finish aggregation. And the other issue, the other window, the sliding windows is very memory hungry. So you would need to store all the raw events. In the hopping window case, you only need to store the partial aggregates. So what's the trade-off here? Sawtooth windows are not free. The issue with sawtooth windows is that we are going to sacrifice tail precision. So the tail is mo moving by hops, but the head is moving you know, with all the new events. Right. But the trade-off here is that sawtooth windows are fresh and they're cheap. So how do we maintain this in the background? So how do we store all of this in the key value store? So each of these boxes, red boxes, are raw events at different points in time. And we are trying to compute a seven-day window. And we break the window into three pieces. The head of the window, which is the most recent events, the middle part of the window, so which is the five days, so for a seven day window that would be five days, and the tail of the window. So what's the point of head, mid, and tail? So in the tail, we store the hops. We looked at hops in the sawtooth window, right? We just store the hops. In the mid, we combine all the hops into a single value. And we use batch processing to upload this into the key value store every so often. Right. And we use stream processing to keep new values in the key value store. So what does this give us? If you look at this, we are reading very few boxes. Each box represents the amount of data that we need to read. And the result is just combining these partial aggregations into one single aggregation. Right. So the idea is we are storing and reading fewer boxes on every request. All right. So that means lower uh, latency, lower cost, lower I.O. Right. So what, in this example, there is one more complication. Complication is that these transactions mutate. So let's say you go to a restaurant and you know, pay for it and add a tip. Your credit card first bills the non-tip amount, and then tip gets added later. So how do we handle that? We talked about subtraction, right? Uh, so before I go into that, another aspect of change data is that you can create features over databases that already exist, that are live, without reading the database. So what do I mean by that? So databases emit uh, mutations or change data. In uh, tidyb terms, it's called change data capture or whatever. And 
what we can do is we can avoid reading the database directly, but listen to the mutation stream. So what's this, what, why is this very important? Let's say you are in eBay and you're trying to power the search ranking model with the Z-score features. What would you need to do usually is you would need to go talk to the payments team and change their service and ask them to give access to that database. And they usually won't give you that uh, access because you're going to do range scan. It's pretty dangerous. It can bring down the database and it will have very high latency. So instead of going through to the database directly, instead we listen to the mutations. We look at the snapshots that are stored in the warehouse and compute features over that. Right. And the idea is this is really low cost. You don't have to talk to different uh, folks in the company which are, who are in like different organizations and get your features without having to deal with other services. All right. So the key thing about dealing with uh, mutations is that you need subtraction. So if you are storing some count mean and variance, we can subtract them. Whenever a new event comes in, we can subtract the sum and count very easily. Right? And why does subtraction matter? So in a database, there is updates and deletes. Right? So when the transaction amount is updated, what happens to the mean? We need to subtract the old value and add the new value. Right. But there are other aggregations that cannot be subtracted. So min, max are some things that cannot be uh, subtracted. So what this means is that basically you cannot use Kappa architecture. You have to, to correct the data on an ongoing basis for the aggregations that cannot be subtracted. You need a batch job that looks at the whole set of data and recomputes the aggregations. All right, so this is what kind of motivates the Lambda architecture and why we need to keep updating the tail of the window and the mid of the window again and again. First one is for uh, change data and non subtractable aggregations. The second reason is that sometimes your data is buggy. You go and fix the underlying data and you want that to reflect in your feature store immediately. Right? So if you use Kappa architecture, you would need to mutate the state of the stream processing job. Kappa architecture is pure streaming. So in that case, it would be very hard to push data into the state of the stream processing job very easily. In Lambda architecture, it's pretty straightforward. We are recomputing the snapshot of the tail of the window again and again. So any corrections will propagate into the feature store very seamlessly. And the other reason is sometimes streaming systems go down. And when they go down, they create gaps in aggregations. And you want to fill those gaps when the data is available. So if you have the Lambda architecture, after the next upload, you're going to fix away all the gaps. And the last reason is that Kappa architecture will force you to store very large state. So you cannot, it's super hard to scale this kind of state in a stream processing job. All right, so simple recap. We went through Z-score example, which is basically how far from the distribution you are and use that as a feature to detect unusual transactions. And then we uh, looked at the sawtooth window. Sawtooth window helps us like keep it fresh but also keep it cheap. And change data is like allows us to uh, listen to data that powers a service but without having to directly interact with the services. So if you're in a com reasonably sized company, there is like you know, hundreds of services and you want to derive features on data that powers each of these services but you don't want to modify them because that's going to be super expensive. And especially if you're a data scientist, you're not the kind of person who would want to go and change service code that is in, written in Java. You probably want to just define your features, write your SQL query, and be done with. And we talked about Lambda architecture and why Lambda architecture is important. Right. I will just pause there uh, and take any questions. So in streaming thing, uh, so let me go back. 
We don't handle state. That's a short answer. We, uh, we use very short state, basically. We keep, so here you see that we uh, propagate raw data in the streaming job directly into the key value store. Right. But in reality, we also convert those into hops. We overwrite the raw data with hops. So we want to keep the state of the streaming job to be as small as possible. In this architecture, there is no state. But in reality, we store the hops, so the 10-minute hop or the 5-minute hop, and like push that into the key value store. So we are simultaneously writing this thing, writing the raw events and the hops, and on read we are pulling back and cleaning up the old ones. Any other questions? Yeah, so these numbers we have come upon by a few things. One thing is the cadence at which we upload the mid and tail of the window. We upload them every day. So the tail of the window, so here it's shown as one day, but actually two days to give a little bit more buffer. And the hops, they are calculated by the size of the actual window. So if your window is seven days, we want the hop to be around uh, one hour. And if it's very short, like one hour window, then we want the hop to be five minutes. So we automatically adjust those things for the users. Any other questions? Yeah, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, this is like a like a, like logic part you covered. Uh, can you tell us a little bit like the infra part, like how the streaming is handling? Yeah. Like, so like, that, like the tooling you are using to make, make all of this happen. We use Airflow to orchestrate all of this thing, and we use Spark to do the batch portion. We were using Flink to do the streaming portion, but we moved back to Spark streaming so that we have uniform API for everything. Okay, thank you. Uh, has this been open sourced already, or, and if not, what's the plan? And can you talk a little bit about like how much data is flowing through internally in your systems on this? Thank you. So there are two questions. The state of the project, is it open source yet? It's not yet, but we are planning to. And the other question is about the size of the data that's flowing through the system. So what I can probably mention publicly is the number of features that are flowing through the system, not the size of the data. So there is about 9,000 features across the company that are powered by uh, this system. I don't know if that. Any timelines on open sourcing it? <laughs> Sorry. So at this time, we are not like ready to give out a definitive timeline, but we are working towards it. So I think since we have a bit of time, you know, I want to show some examples of the code that people would write to. So I'll just skip through these. All right, so let's say instead of just one transaction, uh, Z-score, we want to do distribution shift for user transactions, merchant transactions, and the user merchant transaction pair. So what do I mean by that? So we're trying to detect if a transaction is fraudulent by looking at how far it is away from the usual transaction of a user, how far it is away from the usual transaction of the merchant, and how far it is away from the usual transaction between this user merchant pair. So let's say you go to Starbucks and you know, pay for coffee $5 every day, and suddenly you pay $1,000. Know, that means it's fraudulent. Right? So that's what I mean by the pair. So uh, next will be the code example that I'm going to show you. And in that code example, we are only going to select for uh, transactions that have been successful, not cancel transactions or refund and transactions, and where the amount is greater than zero. It's just a dummy filter. So here is a code example. Uh, one thing about Cronon is that we allow you to define uh, compound sources. So you can specify the table, the topic, and the CDC sources all as a single source, and apply the transformation over that source. So this is 
doing the transformation over stream processing data or like streaming data, the Hive table and the CDC table. So there is a snapshot and the mutation table. Right. So if you see, this is a function that returns a group by, and it takes key columns as a parameter. Why do I have the function here? We are creating three feature groups that have very similar logic. The only difference is that they're different in the keys. Right? And we are computing mean and variance of the transaction for that key. And if you look at the very bottom, we are building this group by for user merchant and user merchant pair, like we talked about earlier. So one of the main points of this code example is that if you were writing SQL queries plainly, you would be copying, pasting a lot of SQL queries. Right? And a lot of our users tend to do very similar aggregation, but on different keys or like slightly different parameters or slightly different filters. And this is one of the longstanding quips about SQL. It's kind of hard to um, reuse. So if you have a similar pipeline, you'd have to like copy paste. But in real programming languages, you don't do that. Right? You create a function that returns, returns something that can be reused. Right. And these are the filters we talked about earlier. So why Python? You know, ergonomics is one of the reasons. But the biggest reason is that you can reuse these building blocks and logic blocks very easily. Right. And this is just the user-facing API. The backend is all written in Scala. Ergonomics is the usability of this. how easy it would be to use and maintain a set of SQL queries versus, you know, Python functions that are broken down. All right, I think that will be it for my talk then. Thanks for taking the time.